Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. COVID-19 is raging through India. Hospitals at capacity, out of oxygen, and thousands are dying every day. And now a local nonprofit organization is stepping in to help. Tiffany Huertas has a look at how this devastating situation impacting family and friends of San Antonians. When I see these images from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic here uh, in, in India, it, it's heartbreaking. COVID-19 cases are skyrocketing in India. I've got friends and family in India. Misal Merchant, president of the nonprofit organization San Antonio Indian Nurses Association, or SINA, says something needs to be done immediately. We are urging folks to consider any donation that they think is possible for them. Sina is raising money to help people in India. With hospitals overflowing with COVID-19 patients, Merchant says the money raised will help medical facilities with PPE and other items. He says money will also go to providing hygiene kits to the most vulnerable people. In the last two years, San Antonio Indian Nurses Association has worked tirelessly to serve the community of San Antonio. Now they are dedicating all their efforts in helping in India. The White House says the U.S. is working around the clock to deploy available resources and supplies to India. It gives us a hope that yes, the administration is going to do something. The next week or two is going to be very critical in seeing if that deployment actually happens. He has a message to those waiting for assistance. Hang in there. Help is on the way. Merchant says organizations are already thinking of different ways to help people in India deal with post-traumatic stress disorder. To find out how you can help, visit KSAT.com. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Meanwhile, with vaccinations ramped up in much of Europe and in the U.S., travel beginning to open up. In fact, vaccinated Americans may be able to fly to Europe as early as this summer. The European Union, which is 27 nations working to welcome vaccinated Americans soon. That's according to the New York Times. Uh, details are still in the works, such as how to show proof of vaccination. Your CDC white card, one way to possibly bypass other testing or quarantine protocols. Your phone could likely be another. And then they're also working on a number of different digital apps. Think a free app on your phone where you can upload your proof of vaccination and then be able to uh, show it anytime a border official or somewhere asks for uh, proof of vaccination. The EU is not given an exact time frame for changing its travel policies, but the American tourism, a huge financial boost for, for in summer months for Europe. Travel experts expect a lot of bookings because of pent-up desire to travel. Vaccines appear to be getting easier and easier to find across San Antonio. The city now even offering homebound services, which essentially delivers vaccines to those in need. Max Massey explains this program and shows us a new obstacle the city is now trying to overcome, vaccine hesitancy. It's very important because I think um, if we want to ever, ever get back to any kind of normalcy, we need to get those vaccinations to the folks. In an effort to vaccinate as many people across the Alamo City as possible, paramedics were loading up early this morning for the new homebound program. The homebound program is a vaccination, the COVID-19 vaccination uh, program that's really uh, built and designed for folks that can't really make it out to the to the community site. This program works as a sort of vaccine delivery service to those most in need. The team works strategically with the Food Bank, Meals on Wheels, Metro Health District, and other community partners throughout San Antonio to compile that list, and then come morning, they head out to vaccinate. We give about 1,000 to 1,200 uh, home vaccinations a week. The Alamo Dome drive through Vaccination Distribution Center is one of the most popular places in San Antonio for people to get their vaccines, but now the problem city officials are seeing, people more and more being hesitant to actually get the vaccine. More than 50% of the eligible population has received at least one dose of the vaccine. That's more than a million. Um, but we're starting to reach that point where we need more people to get that vaccine so that we can get back to normal. We're a mess. So now the city is thinking more outside the box. What we're trying to do is educate and inform residents that it's a safe and effective vaccine that's built on science. Um, but the most fun way to do that is to work with local musicians and artists. So we've got some songs, music videos, murals that are coming out to our, our districts. If you're interested in taking part in the homebound program to have a vaccine brought to you, you can reach out via 311 or to this email on your screen. 
SFD MVP at sanantonio.gov. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. The work week certainly off to a rough start for some people at a convenience store. San Antonio police say the trouble started before the business was even open with a man breaking in, then attacking workers. Katrina Weber spoke to another man who witnessed it all and says he did what he could to help. The tape all around the parking lot shows this store at Fair Avenue and Interstate 37 is off limits, a crime scene. San Antonio police say the trouble happened while the 7-Eleven was still closed for other reasons. That a man smashed through the locked glass door before four this morning, then went on the attack against employees. Man, they were so terrified. They, was, they were crying and screaming for help, and I, I didn't know what else to do but to go in there and help them. Mario Garza well, says he the, noticed the, the commotion as he rode past on his bicycle. He broke out the window. He was trying to kill the, he was trying to kill the ladies, and I, I got in the way. Garza says the man who had forced his way into the store was armed with a pair of screwdrivers and chasing the employees. He was nicked on his arm as he tried to step in and help. He wasn't trying to take the money, he wasn't trying to take nothing. He was just in there just trying to just stab the lady for some reason. I don't know why. With a bandage on his wrist, Garza was soon back on his bike and back on his way. The suspect was taken away in an ambulance. Police still have no idea what prompted this whole thing. They say the suspect had just a minor cut on his hand, but they had some concerns about his health and safety, so they had him taken to a hospital. Reporting from the South Side, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police investigating a hit and run that happened near downtown last night. According to SAPD, this crash happened at the intersection of North Alamo Street and 8th Street near Bentley's Beer Garden, where a 34 year old woman and two friends were crossing the street. The driver hit the woman, narrowly missing the two others. Police say the woman has been hospitalized, is expected to make a full recovery. The driver was pulled over and arrested for driving under the influence. The deadline has now passed. The Texas Department of Family and Protective Services putting a placement hold on the San Antonio Children's Shelter's emergency shelter known as the Cottage late last week. This hold means the shelter needed to find new placements for the children currently staying there. And the deadline to move those kids out was just about an hour ago. Yeah, in a letter sent to the Children's Shelter from the Commissioner of DFPS, Jamie Masters, Masters says the shelter rejected nine children into its care. After the children are out of the cottage, we're told the state will step in to handle the cases the facility could not. In the letter, Masters said, quote, the situation is unacceptable and threatens the safety of the children. There is no other way to put it, end quote. To read the full letter, you can head to ksat.com. One more day to vote early in the May 1st city election. Early voting wraps up tomorrow, but polls are open for a full 12 hours Tuesday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Election day is on Saturday, May 1st. To see a sample ballot or to learn more about the issues on the ballot, go to ksat.com slash vote. Live cam this evening and uh, a lot of clouds out there, and that's kind of been the way it's been all day. Very yeah, different from the weekend. <laughs> Very different from the weekend. The weekend was nothing but sunshine, comfortable conditions. The humidity's on the rise a little bit. And you see a decent amount of cloud cover out there. But get ready for a lot of gray in our sky in the days ahead. And rain chances are actually looking better. We're pretty optimistic. 67 this morning, then we topped out at 87 degrees for a high temperature, both above average for this time of year. You look outside right now. We're at 85 degrees, dew point is 61. Southeasterly breeze noticeable at 21 miles per hour. And it's gonna really boost our mugginess and humidity overnight tonight. Right now, 89 in Lotus, 83 Comfort, 85 Pleasanton and 88 right now in Hondo. As we go through the evening, we'll gradually fall through the 80s, then the 70s. So by 10 o'clock, 75, midnight, 73. Low clouds really developing overnight, and that could lead to some areas of patchy drizzle. A little bit of dampness to start the day tomorrow. But by and large, we'll see some scattered activity here and there through the midday and afternoon. So about a 40% chance tomorrow. And if something develops west of town, could even become severe. We're going to talk about our next disturbance and rain chances when they peak coming right up. Flames billowing out of this two-story home caused one family to lose everything, but that family staying positive about their future, their story tonight. 
just a few seconds away now from the COVID-19 briefing for the city and the county happening twice a week. Now we're seeing the numbers in the hospitals stay relatively steady, which is a great thing. The number yeah. of vaccinations going up. However, there's concern that that could be leveling off as a lot of people have gotten it who want to get it and others may be dealing with some vaccine hesitancy. Yeah, it, right now the supply is outstripping the demand, which is a reversal of what it was just yeah. a few weeks ago. And so a big question is how is San Antonio you're going to combat that along with the county. How are they going to convince people to get a vaccine? It'll be part of what they'll probably discuss coming up here in just a few seconds. Uh, you know, we have seen the hospitalizations hover around the 200 mark. That seems to be a mark where the county and city officials decide whether, you know, we're doing well or not doing so well. It's not so much the daily cases we're seeing anymore. It's the hospitalizations. And we actually heard one of the county commissioners in the briefing last Thursday talk about how some of the COVID-19 units in local hospitals have been shut down because they are no longer needed. That's not to say they're not ready to go at a moment's notice but that is a good sign that the stress level in our hospitals that they've all been dealing with for over a year now, that seems to be on the downward trend. Yeah, and if they haven't been shut down, they've certainly been reduced in a lot of the area hospitals where they just don't need as many beds for the uh, COVID ICU wing as they did, which is good news, but it's not so good news if we get hit by another wave. Let's listen in now at City Hall. Assistant City Manager, Dr. Colleen Bridger, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Today's weekly vaccination report shows that 855,326 individuals have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine here in Bear County and 55,000, excuse me, 558,986,000 uh, 986 people have been fully vaccinated. This means that we now have 55 percent of our population who has at least one dose and 36% who are fully vaccinated. We continue to exceed both state and national averages and we are calling on you to let folks that you know who haven't been vaccinated uh, get their appointment as soon as they can. As a reminder, people ages 16 and up can now go to the Alamo Dome on a walk-in basis from 12 p.m. to 5 p.m. or until capacity is reached to receive the COVID-19 vaccine without an appointment. And remember that you can also subscribe to vaccine alerts to be notified when there are appointments available by texting vaccine or vacuna to 55000. Again, uh, you do not need an appointment now to get a vaccine. It's simpler than ever. So please go get your vaccine as soon as you can. Tonight, we're reporting 233 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total number to 216,339. Our seven-day rolling average is now 246. I'm pleased to report that our positivity rate is at an all-time low and a state-leading number now 1.9%, and indicators remain steady. Last week, we tested 57,000 people in Bear County, and we continue to see a low positivity rate locally. And again, we've been doing better in that department than I think most all major metros in the state of Texas. So let's continue to do our uh, work on that and work together to contain the spread of this virus. Fortunately, today we have new, no new deaths to report today. Uh, please, again, uh, note that our family and friends and neighbors have been reeling from this disease and have lost many of our loved ones. So please continue to keep them in your prayers this evening. There are 262 COVID-19 patients in our local hospitals tonight. Over the last 24 hours, there are 25 new admissions. 80 patients are in the ICU and 50 are on ventilators. Let me turn it down to Judge Wolf. Thanks, Mayor. You know, it's kind of like we've been in a seven furlong race coming around the last bend, coming into the home stretch and uh, looking good. But you can still hear the hoofbeats of the dark god of COVID behind you. And you don't want to let him give a chance to catch you. So if we don't want him to catch us, what do we need to do? We need to get vaccinated. Uh, last week, we did 25,697 at the uh, University Hospital site. But of those, 14,000 were second doses. So we're seeing our numbers continue to go down. I think we were doing 35,000 or so a week, uh, working on some different strategies to try to reach people, smaller events. I know that uh, Commissioner Justin Rodriguez is working on an event at St. Mary's University. We made some grants to the chambers, and I know the uh, uh, Greater Chamber is going to start on a program trying to get more vaccinations, maybe at the workplace, another event at St. Margaret Mary's Church. So we're all trying to reach out to smaller 
venues and and try to make sure everybody has that opportunity to get that to get the vaccine um you know we 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 uh have have been very successful compared to other areas but still there's a lot of people out there that haven't we know that some you know was absolutely refused to do it and of course that's their choice but um if you're thinking about it and uh, you want to do it, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for you for you to get your shots in an easy manner today. Great. Thank you, Judge. And we're, we are looking forward to seeing more of our neighbors vaccinated so we can start to put this pandemic firmly behind us. Uh, as you know, we've been asking our doctors on the air, frequently asked questions that come into our mental health department. So I'm going to give now Dr. Bridger a question that we've gotten uh, quite often, and that is, Dr. Bridger, is it safe for a woman to get a COVID-19 vaccine if she would like to have a baby one day? Yes, 100% yes, please do. Um, if you are planning on becoming pregnant, um, more and more research is showing just how dangerous COVID infection can be for a pregnant woman and her unborn baby. And um, the research is also very clear that there are no risks associated um, pregnancy-wise with getting vaccinated. So I know that there was a, a nasty rumor out there to that effect, so I'm really glad we got this question today. Please, if you are thinking of getting pregnant, do get vaccinated. That is in the best interest of, of you and your baby's health. All right, there's an answer uh, from Dr. Colleen Bridger from Metro Health and the uh, assistant city manager there. Uh, struck by the positivity rate, we're below 2% right now, 1.9% the positivity rate in the city of San Antonio and the city continues to lead all major metropolitan areas in the state with the lowest positivity rate. Yeah, overall, a really encouraging report, uh, kind of with an asterisk next yeah. to it, just in terms of encouraging people to go out and get their vaccines. Uh, you heard the county judge there talking about how the numbers being administered through University Health, they are slowing down. However, we know vaccinations are available at pharmacies. There are a wide array of areas uh, throughout our community. He talked about University Health trying to spread out the vaccination events to other parts of the community, maybe smaller events yeah, in the workplace, in the workplace, making it easier yeah. for people to get there. Yeah, and uh, right now, 55% of the population of San Antonio going by the rough numbers has at least gotten the first dose of the vaccine. Uh, 558,986, that's 36% that have been fully vaccinated. So those are again, good numbers, but the continuation continue to be concerned about vaccination hesitancy on a big part of our population. Definitely. All right, let's turn it over to the forecast. Now we saw some good rain at the end of last week. Do we have any more chances of that, Adam? Yeah, we are optimistic with our rainfall chances in the days ahead. So let's get right to it. Taking a look at our satellite. Decent amount of cloud cover out there. Yeah, we have some sunshine mixed in, but the clouds will be overtaking the sky through the night and really the next couple of days will feature a fair amount of gray. Not much activity over Texas. You have Head out west, northern Nevada, that's where we have an upper level disturbance, big upper level low. That's our next system to affect us and bring us enhanced rain chances. Now, the next couple of days, just some scattered to widely separated activity. 11 a.m. tomorrow, maybe a few showers popping up out west, a few thunderstorms possible. The midday through the afternoon, widely separated in nature. Not everybody's going to see them here tomorrow and even into Wednesday. But where we do have the storms pop up west of I-35 in particular tomorrow, we could have some severe storms. So that's something to keep an eye on. Tuesday night into early Wednesday, some widely separated activity still out there. So it's going to be hit or miss through tomorrow, tomorrow night, and on into Wednesday. We're expecting the main event to be Wednesday night into the pre dawn hours on Thursday. And that's what our future cast indicates here. The most widespread activity, some embedded heavy downpours, thunderstorms, late Wednesday night and pre dawn hours on Thursday. So just keep in the back of your mind about midnight on Thursday is when right now we're expecting the most numerous showers and storms. And that could give some parts of South Texas well over an inch of rain. That's the nice thing about it. We can't all anticipate that much. But the potential is there, especially within the downpours. So 40% chance tomorrow. Wednesday during the day, only a 30% chance. It's overnight Wednesday into Thursday where we boost those 
rain and storm chances up to 60% and then they fall off again during the day on Thursday. So looking ahead here, 82 tomorrow. We'll start the day at 70, then make it up to 82. 70 Wednesday morning, up near 90 for the high temperature. Thick humidity the next couple of days. You'll really notice it tomorrow and even on Wednesday. And Wednesday, that's going to make some morning drizzle. So a little damp to start the day Wednesday. Some afternoon sun, windy as well. So kind of an active day in general. You'll notice the weather being a little inconvenient at times. Then Wednesday night is when we're expecting the most widespread showers and storms. Thursday, we should clear out a little bit and the humidity should be gone for the second half of the week, but you will be noticing that wind, particularly on Thursday as well. And there's a bit of uncertainty for the end of the week and into the weekend, but right now we're just looking partly cloudy and in, in the mid 80s. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, he's one of those guys who you just personifies being a Dallas Cowboy, yeah. I guess, when you talk about Sean Lee. And the great thing about him, he was very open and honest, one of my favorite all-time interviews with the Dallas Cowboys, because he was especially very honest about his own play, which I thought was a breath of fresh air. When we come back, a Cowboy rides away, and that's Sean Lee into retirement. The question is, will he come back and coach? And the former Baylor coach has arrived at LSU in style. Coming up. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. After 11 seasons with the Dallas Cowboys, linebacker Sean Lee has decided to hang up his star. The 34 year old decided he just doesn't have another year left in him. The former second round pick out of Penn State in 2010 was named to the Pro Bowl twice in his career in 2015 and 2016 and was a team leader on defense. But injuries marred his run in the league. Everything from hamstrings to concussions, missing the entire 2014 season with a torn interior cruciate ligament. But every time he would fight back and return to the gridiron, where he has five of the Cowboys' seven all-time tackle games. He has 995 career tackles, which is eighth in team history, to go along with his 14 interceptions, returning two for touchdowns, five fumble recoveries, and four sacks. He only played in nine games last year after having sports hernia surgery and was thinking about coming back for his 12th season. But that ended today with his statement that reads, in part, and he says, for 11 seasons, I was privileged to wear the Cowboys star. We want to play forever, but today it's my time to walk away. To the Jones family, you treated me as one of your own since I arrived. You allow me to shine and grow as a player and a person. Thank you for your support and graciousness to the coaches. Your endless hours of work made me a better player, pushed me to a place I did not know I could go. To my teammates, I love you like brothers. To the fans, you lifted me up when I needed it the most. I didn't want to let you down. If there's a regret, it's that I never helped bring a championship back home because you deserve it so much. Thank you, Cowboys Nation. It has been my honor. The Cowboys focus now is on the 2021 NFL Draft starting this Thursday live on KSAT 12 where Dallas has a number 10 pick overall and there's no question what their needs are. Cornerback. If the Cowboys don't trade up to get Florida's tight end Kyle Pitts, then they will most likely certainly select a corner. And the two names that keep popping up are Alabama's Patrick Sertain the second and South Carolina's J.C. Horn. The Cowboys have a whopping 10 picks in the draft, including their first, a second, and two third round choices. Here she is. Kim Mulkey has arrived at LSU after dropping the bombshell on Baylor on Sunday that she's leaving Waco, returning to her home state, Louisiana, to become the new women's head basketball coach at LSU. The Hall of Famer replacing Nikki Fargus, who has accepted the position as president of the WNBA Las Vegas Aces, which is the old San Antonio Stars. Mulkey leaves Baylor after 21 seasons, three national championships, building Baylor basketball into a nationally recognized program, missing the NCAA tournament only once in her career with the Bears. Mulkey just completed her first press conference at LSU you just minutes ago. I've been at Baylor 21 years of my life. I built that program from the ground up. I should say we built that program from the ground up. Can you believe there's only one institution I would have left for and they made the commitment and I'm home. It is unclear right now what LSU is paying Mulkey to leave Baylor, but in her last year with the Bears, Mulkey was making $2.27 million. Our San Antonio Spurs continue their four-game road trip tonight with a stop at Washington to face the Wizards. The Spurs are coming off their 110-108 victory over the Pelicans in New Orleans on Saturday behind DeMar DeRozan 32 points, while the Washington Wizards are now on an eight-game win streak after their 119-110 win over the Cleveland Cavaliers last night at home. Both the Spurs and the Wizards are in 10th place in the Western and Eastern Conferences, fighting to stay in play in tournament qualification for the postseason. Both Lonnie Walker IV and Rudy Gay came in a nice game questionable. Gay with a back soreness and this morning Lonnie woke up with a headache, but both are available to play tonight. The game is underway. Now in the first quarter, the Spurs are, I should say, just updated. The Spurs are tied at that point, but I can update you. It's now 22-21 Spurs in the first quarter. And guess who had their first basket tonight? 
Jakob Pertl, basket <laughs> and the foul, and he made the foul shot. Nice. Yes. Good start. <laughs> you got it. Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. It is a moment in American history that those watching will not soon likely forget. The moment the verdict was read in the trial of former officer Derek Chauvin, convicted on all counts in the killing of George Floyd. So now come the questions about the implications of that. What could this mean going forward? So to weigh in on that and give us some perspective when it comes to the past, what we've seen in this country, we want to bring in Dr. Carrie Lattimore, professor of history at Trinity University. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, can you first start with that historical? perspective. We don't often see officers indicted in shootings, much less convicted. So what does this mean to you? In a sense, we don't often see them even brought to trial. So that's a whole, it's a kind of a new thing really to see them brought to trial, indicted, convicted, and then ultimately sentenced. And so throughout our history, it's been very rare to see an officer um, convicted of crimes such as these. Um, and so that puts the George Floyd decision in a separate category in a sense. And it shows us, I think, that justice can be, or, or, or how, should, how we use this word, our court systems can be slow to act, but they do show the capacity to act when the situation arises in which it seems like kind of an easy case. And I think that's kind of the, the Floyd case was that it was so many reasons to convict here that I think that the jury and all of the systems around it saw, saw it to do that way. And that's, that's my question. Is, is there a legacy here to the George Floyd case? Uh, or is this, you know, just one and done? I mean, I, what are your thoughts on, as a history professor, looking back and looking forward, what is George Floyd's legacy? Looking back, we've seen so many cases, Emmett Till, in which it wasn't dealing with police, but Emmett Till, the murder of a young man, 1955, um, the mother opens the casket up for people to see, so the media is brought in. A similar kind of situation, which kind of helps to usher in a civil rights movement. We have Rodney King, um, not a conviction there. We have a conviction here. Each of these cases, the media was heavily involved. So I think that that shows something. I think that the arc of the way that we see justice or the way that we see jurisdiction is a little bit different here because so many people came to say that what, George, what happened with George Floyd was wrong. Um, whereas in the other times, it seemed to be the African-American community almost alone in that case. So I think that that separates George Floyd. Now, yes, the George Floyd situation, you have a person leaning on somebody for such a long period of time. Um, this is an extraordinary case because of the evidence. Lots of people witnessed it. You have a very clear video. Um, it's not an issue where a cop could say that it was done over a period of seconds. And so it was a pressure filled situation. Um, so all of those cases really worked in favor of the kind of decision that we ended up with. Um, but I, I do hope, and the optimist in me hopes that this is a sign that accountability, um, we can look for accountability. We expect it, but hopefully it's a sign of a new time in which accountability is more brought into the fore. You know, you and I've had conversations over the last year about the protests following the death of George Floyd framed by the movement of Black Lives Matter. And we've had conversations about how that is a, it's a different movement than what we have seen in the past. Now with the conviction in this case, do, how do you think, given your historical perspective, how do you think that may change or does it change the narrative of the Black Lives Matter movement? I think we'll have to wait and see. Um, when I was a young, when I was about 14, 15, we had the Rodney King situation. We thought that that was a new movement at that point in time because things were changing and you had a lot of um, protests and then it kind of died down. We'll have to see here. I think the difference is that the movement is so diverse and it includes so many different kinds of people, different ages, different backgrounds. Um, and I think that it's the, the fact that you have so many people involved on different sides of so many different issues makes it a much more, it's gonna be much more sustainable. And I think that with the media and also video cameras and body cams and all of these things, um, we're really having a kind of reassessment of um, policing in our nation, which we didn't really have that after Rodney King. I think we have that now. And I think that this is a moment in which um, there's an opportunity for significant change in the way that our nation sees policing and what we expect from our police etc. 
Carrie, you and I, have t we, we've talked on air and you've been very open about growing up in the South and growing up with Confederate statues and Confederate reminders all around you and, and how that affected you as a young child. I'm, I'm curious, I want you to take off the professor's cap here now. How did the George Floyd decision affect you personally? You know, I did not watch much of the trial and that's because I, I didn't want to see those images over and over and over again. Um, I've seen enough of them. Um, I was relieved when the decision came in because I thought that it was kind of a, I thought it was a pretty easy case, personally. That's just my personal opinion here. Um, I was relieved that accountability, um, someone was held accountable for this. But I have to admit, I thought about all of the other times in which people died, were murdered or lynched, in which there was no one held accountable. Um, I still think about Emmett Till. Um, in which we know that there are perhaps people still alive who were accountable, who have never been brought to justice. And I think about those cases, too. And I think that that's, in a sense, why this is such a difficult issue, because it's so raw for so many people. And so many people have experiences of this in their families, in their communities, in their states. Um, and because of that, all of these issues are raw. And I think it's still raw for me, and I think it's still raw for a lot of people. But at least in this case, we have accountability. Um, we hope that it's the turn, that we're turning another corner here, and that we'll see more accountability, and that we'll expect more accountability. Um, although we do understand that each individual case is different and has to be viewed differently. Accountability. Now we see what justice for Derek Chauvin will look like. We wait until June for the sentencing in this case. Dr. Kerry Lattimore, always appreciate your perspective. Thank you so much. Take care. We'll be right back. The President Joe Biden expected to announce new mask guidance on Tuesday. Sources say he will release updated outdoor mask wearing guidance during his state of the pandemic remarks. A November review in the Journal of Infectious Diseases found that less than 10% of COVID-19 infections studied occurred outside. Several states still have outdoor mask mandates in place. Look outside with live cam this evening. Plenty of sunshine over the weekend. A lot more clouds out there today. Wondering if we can get some rain out of this eventually, Adam. Yeah, if we're going to have clouds, we might as well have them do some work for us, right? Give us a little uh, rainfall activity. And we are optimistic for rainfall in the days ahead. So let's talk about this evening first. 85 right now. Southeast really breeze at 21. So you notice the wind out there. By 10 o'clock, mid 70s, midnight 73. We'll start the day tomorrow right near 70. So temperatures not changing a whole lot overnight. And you're not going to see a big fluctuation in the days ahead. But we are anticipating some areas of rain and even the peak by the middle part of the week. We'll time it out for you in more detail coming right up. to watch when it comes to the weather this week, Kasky. Yeah, yeah not we, too late for April showers. Oh, right. it's never too late. They could be June showers, <laughs> July we'll showers. Yeah. If we get them in June and July, bring it on. We'll take them, yeah. right? Then we're ultra lucky if they come yes, in July right. into August. Usually we're just talking how hot is it going to be that time of year. But this is the time of year where we usually see a little spike in rainfall. And we are rather optimistic for later on this week, especially a certain time frame. We'll have a few showers and thunderstorms here and there, scattered in nature, widely separated tomorrow and Wednesday, but the storm chances really peak Wednesday night. That's when we're expecting the most widespread activity and high temperatures really remaining in the 80s. We'll be near 90 at a times, but for the most part, we'll be in the 80s. Here's a look at the cloud cover out there. Clouds are rolling in. They've been coming and going throughout the day. They'll be really increasing overnight tonight. And if you notice the direction they're coming from, coming from the southwest, that's that's Pacific moisture in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere that's moving overhead. And that's good because that's going to be in place when we combine some of that moisture with, of course, our increasing Gulf moisture and a disturbance that's currently far to the northwest of us that'll be dropping in. This upper disturbance over Nevada will be our primary driving force in the days ahead, especially Wednesday night. But as I showed you in the satellite imagery, we've got some mid and upper moisture streaming in. Our mugginess is going to be increasing tonight and tomorrow, and so we'll have some good moisture to work with as well, which is something you always need in place in order to generate rain. 
Here's our future cast, and what I really want to point out is that don't look at the specifics in terms of exactly where it's showing showers and thunderstorms in the days ahead. Just the mere fact that it's developing them as we should see. So looking ahead to six o'clock tomorrow, a few widely separated showers and thunderstorms developing. Can't rule out a severe storm, especially west of I-35. Closer to the Rio Grande tomorrow afternoon is the greatest chance for a few severe storms. We go through tomorrow night. On into early Wednesday morning, some scattered activity and where it's not raining Wednesday morning, it's going to be damp. We'll have some drizzle, so definitely some dampness for the middle part of the week. But most of the day on Wednesday, we're not expecting a whole lot of action. It's Wednesday night after sunset, especially around midnight as we get into Thursday morning. That's when we should get most of our energy and lift from that upper disturbance and see the most widespread activity developing on the radar screen and there is the potential for some decent accumulations. We'll get into that in a moment. First of all, tomorrow we're at about a 40% chance. So some scattered or widely separated activity Wednesday during the day, 30%, but Wednesday night overnight into Thursday, we boosted up to 60% and we may even be raising that a little bit more uh, in the days ahead. As for the rainfall potential, this is looking good for parts of Texas, particularly the I-35 corridor from Dallas to Waco to Austin to San Antonio, even parts of the Hill Country. This is a very generalized map here. This should say 2.0, not 0 0.2, just so you know, a little clarification there. This is generalized. Obviously, when it comes to thunderstorms, we all know you're going to have the haves and have nots, but this just indicates that there is good potential out there for some decent accumulations. It just depends on where the heaviest downpour is set up. So cross your fingers for your neighborhood. You could get another inch or more between now and Thursday morning. 85 right now, dew point is 61. That southeasterly wind, we notice it. It's coming off the Gulf. It's going to increase those deweys tonight. Very sticky day tomorrow. We're in the 80s now. New Braunfels 86, Seguin 85. 85 in Castorville, even in the hill country, lower 80s, Kerrville and Comfort at 82. So we'll start the day tomorrow at 70, make it up to 85, a mainly gray day, a few peaks of sun here and there, but mainly gray and some scattered or widely separated hit or miss showers and thunderstorms throughout the day and even tomorrow night. Wednesday, a windy day. That's another factor I want to point out. A pretty stout southeasterly breeze. And it's going to remain windy into Thursday. We're just going to switch the wind direction there. Notice those highs mostly just in the 80s. And being the election geek I am, I'm looking at Saturday and mm -hmm. going, okay, <laughs> no reason not to get out and vote. Yes. All good. Yeah. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's I See Why Am I. It is Monday morning. It is April 26th. Lufkin police out in East Texas put out an alert for a kidnapping of that woman yesterday. Officers here in San Antonio tracked her to a phone on the east side overnight and spotted a vehicle involved. Police attempted to pull the vehicle over and the suspect took off, leading police on a high-speed chase around San Antonio. Speeds reached up to 100 miles an hour. The suspect in the car was eventually arrested. They say the fire caused about $300,000 in damage. The home is now considered a total loss. We're told everyone inside the home made it out safely. In a letter sent to the Children's Shelter, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services says the shelter rejected a total of nine children into its care in two separate instances, which the department says not only violates contractual obligations, but threatens the safety of the children. A San Antonio homeowner had a rather rude awakening this morning, a man breaking into his home. SAPD says the suspect had already gotten inside several homes in the same area. The homeowner who was sleeping woke up and fought back. At one point, police say the homeowner got a hold of the suspect's gun and fired several shots. The suspect took off running, was arrested shortly after. It didn't happen here, but the state's seat of power was left shaken by allegations involving a staffer, a lobbyist, and Rohypnol, best known as the date rape drug that easily dissolves in the drinks of the unsuspecting. And I am disgusted that this sort of predatory behavior is still taking place in and around our capital. <gasps> All right, you can call it a new kind of food combination. Smart food partnering with Krispy Kreme to create popcorn flavored like it's glazed, like it's glazed donuts. This glazed not, donuts popcorn. This I guess. might not be all that unusual for smart food. According to their website, they make other bizarre flavors too, including fried pickle popcorn. 
and flavors inspired by Cold Stone Creamery ice cream. Okay, mm. this is happening. So they say, for now, the snacks are only available at Sam's Club. I would try it. And give it a whirl. Yeah. Take a look outside tonight, and maybe you can catch a glimpse of a pink supermoon. NASA says the moon will be at its fullest Monday at 11.32 p.m. Eastern Time. It's 10.32 for us. So tonight That's at 10.32. That's right, 10.32. Okay. Supermoons appear bigger and brighter because they're slightly closer to Earth. April's will be one of four supermoons in a row. Two more are expected in May and June, and although it's called a pink moon, it's not really a different color. The name comes from the pink early springtime blooms of the Fox Subulata plant native to eastern North America. OK, let's tell you about something happening tomorrow, and then Adam Kasky is going to school us in all things pink supermoon. Yeah. Election day only five days away. One of the big issues on the ballot is Proposition B. San Antonio voters will decide whether the police union gets to keep its right to collectively bargain. There's a lot that goes into this, and we're trying to help you understand all the details and the arguments for and against. A special presentation of Case That Explains Prop B right here tomorrow at 630 to give you all the details on how you can make a decision. I don't think we're going to get to the pink moon. We're not going to. We'll, to, we'll save so it for 10. Unfortunate.